I'm Wendy Peters Muschetti. I'm director of food systems at Live Well Colorado. And I'm with Dwayne Wharton, who is the um, director of external affairs from Hello. the Food Trust, which is based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And for those of you who were here at our Heal Summit today, you know that Dwayne was our keynote this morning uh, and kicked off the summit um, with, uh, with a lot of words about sharing his own ex personal experience and professional experience and sort of what brought him into this world of, of food justice and um, advocating at many different levels to remove barriers to access to healthy food. So we have this opportunity to sit down and talk a little bit more about a lot of issues that you brought up this morning. Yep, happy to. Great. So we had, um, we had a little bit of time when you were done talking to address some questions. So some more questions have come up uh, that we'd love to dive in a little bit deeper with you sure. about. So um, a first sort of set of questions that I'm really curious to hear more from your perspective about kind of fall into this bucket of sort of restriction and regulation mm -hmm. and issues I think of that people don't like to talk about a lot because people like to talk about how do we promote access to healthy food yep. and how do we incentivize new grocery stores Correct. and how do we bring in farmers markets and one thing that you brought up is you brought up a couple of things you brought up food swamps so mm -hmm. this notion of having sort of this overabundance mm -hmm. of less healthy sort of food environments mm -hmm. corner stores and liquor stores and convenience stores and you also brought up soda taxes yep. and so issues that bring to mind a lot of like how do we and when do we and if do we do actually restrict or regulate parts of our food environment that may not be as health promoting. So some questions that came up specifically were about the soda taxes that you brought up that mm -hmm. have passed in Philadelphia itself. So some questions were, were about um, can you talk about soda taxes as an anti-poverty measure yep. and as a follow-up talk about how do you respond to the argument that these taxes might be regressive? Yeah. So the unique thing about Philadelphia, I think, is its approach to the tax itself. Mm -hmm. um, it failed twice uh, under <laughs> prior administrations uh -huh. to pass when it had primarily a health focus. So this new administration yeah. decided that health was not the priority, but it would really focus on anti-poverty measures. So, so pre-K the, slots. The revenue, Correct, the revenue would itself. address anti-poverty efforts initiatives in the city. Correct. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So that's you know universal pre-K. So 2,000 okay. kindergarten slots uh, yeah. for children, giving them a, an early start in life mm -hmm. with the idea that it pays off later on um, was important. Um, the improvement to our infrastructure, like our parks yeah. and our rec centers and our libraries, which are in you know dramatic... Uh, disrepair. Yeah. 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 So that was how the administration chose to kind of uh, frame hmm. the need around the tax itself. Huh. Um, as a public health organization, you know, the Food Trust yeah. really maintained that health is our reason for supporting yeah. the tax itself. Sure. So as you said, you know, we do try to provide pro incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, support to businesses, mm -hmm. fresh food financing initiatives, right. and support to healthy food retailers mm -hmm. at corner stores. Yep. But this tax is a little bit different. We understand through history that, you know, when you do tax items using tobacco as an example, yep. we see a decline in mm -hmm. tobacco use, particularly with young kids who are more price sensitive. Yep. So with that in mind, Adding a bit more cost to this product, soda, which really has been overly marketed mm -hmm. to young people, yep. overly marketed specifically to young people of, of color, color in yep. underserved, under-resourced communities, communities. To, begin, yep. to begin with, right? Yep. So we you know, decided that mm -hmm. we were going to support mm -hmm. this measure solely to try to improve health, to get these kids to mm -hmm. drink less soda. Mm -hmm. But also we looked at the revenue that would fund pre-K as being an excellent opportunity yep. to improve yep. long-term health. Absolutely. You're channeling that right back into prevention. Correct. Right? So by the time they're teenagers, they have that foundation, so they're making different choices perhaps anyway. Right. Yeah. But to understand this also is that there are lots of complementary efforts that 
were in place in Philadelphia. So mm. for a decade, we okay. had been already working with food retailers to help them sell healthier items oh, and healthier nice. beverages. Absolutely. So when the tax you know, mm -hmm. was enacted, we felt the need to double down in those efforts mm -hmm. to help them mitigate their yeah. fear of loss of Absolutely. revenue. Absolutely. So they were here from you, and you had that foundation. Correct. Years of relationships. So it wasn't just like this coalition coming in and saying, we're going to implement this tax. You, we know it's going to hurt your revenue, but right. trust me, it's going to be okay. Right. You had years of relations with saying, we're here to support you. We're doing all these right. other issues. It was interesting that the data is coming out that it isn't necessarily hurting revenue. So soda sales are down. Yeah. Um, and there's some questions around that and whether or not it's going to kind of meet its fiscal goal to fund yeah. the programs that it's intended to fund. Uh -huh. But sales in stores are not down. So they're selling more There's water, they're selling more juices. Yep. Right, so yeah. that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, yeah. something that we'll continue to explore. And have you seen then a coalition of these stores and retailers sort of come on board and be advocates for this work as well? Mm. Or are we not there yet? We're not there yet. Okay. Um, there are a few who have really um, been champions for this issue for health reasons, mm -hmm. for just wanting to become you know, a, a, a business that is more sustainable, not only for their physical health, but for mm -hmm. the health of their communities, because yeah, these customers need to stay around <laughs> absolutely. So and continue to be customers. Yep. Yep. So we've had and some- And there's owners that live in these communities. Correct, right? and they do yeah. care, right. Yeah. So we have, we've, had, we've yeah. had a few, um, but huh. I think that uh, there's been a lot of backlash from some businesses and from the beverage industry around this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we're holding, holding strong. Yeah. And interestingly enough, then you do see I think some of beverage industry and other, you know, partners use some of what you think would be sort of our language as advocates that yeah. these are regressive, yeah, right? That's this really is, interesting. So it is interesting. So how you know, how do you typically respond and, and sort of say we're not restricting choice, we're not right. being discriminatory against low income populations. Correct. We're actually removing barriers that have been put in place for low-income populations. What are you know, what are some talking points? Yeah, that's here? that's really a challenge, um, especially when you look at the amount of resources that the beverage industry has put to yeah. spin that message. Yeah. You know, first labeling it a grocery tax. It's not a tax on groceries. Right. It's on beverages that yeah. have added sweeteners. Right. Period. And or in the case of Boulder here locally, our one example, it's a tax on a distributor. Right. Yeah. Correct. Well, yeah. the same actually yeah. is how it's structured yeah. in yeah. Philadelphia as well. Um, there's no tax on thirst. You know, uh, fruit juices, mm -hmm. milk, water, That's all right. of that is tax-free. They're all free. available. And things that are going to be better for you in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Great. So another, some other questions I had were um, about, so your comment you made about food swamps. Yeah. Um, and where we, and we see it, I think this is a universal story, right, yeah. across the country. I think urban, suburban, rural communities where... Um, you tend to see a congregation of convenience stores and corner stores and liquor stores and quite often in under-resourced communities, yeah. um, communities of color. And so some questions I, I always struggle with as well is then what are like politically feasible, right, mm. viable strategies that we could have to address some of that? Like, mm. you know what I mean? Do we... Or do we continue to do what the Food Trust has been doing for years and we work store by store and we promote and we incentivize? Right. Does it ever get to a point where we actually start talking about regulation yeah. or restriction? Or what are, you know what I mean? What are our policies? Yeah, it's interesting. So everyone loves the free market and free enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing is that there was this notion that many of these communities did not even want healthier options, right? right. So right. that... They could not no have for success right. selling these items in their yes. communities. So that's yeah. a myth, and yep. it's not true. Um, yep. There's a tremendous demand, not only for healthier items, but people are even pushing it further, looking at more sustainably grown, you know, things that are more local, yeah. Um, yeah. things that are organic in yeah. community. People yeah. know what's good for them. Yeah, right? of course. So yeah. I think that... And we all want to feed ourselves and our families good, healthy food. Right, so it's right. a broken model at yep. this point, yep. right? So there's an oversaturation of unhealthy foods mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. poor communities. Mm -hmm. If you look at many communities that are more affluent, you don't see stores selling tobacco. Yep. You don't see stores with a primary focus on selling junk food. Yep. They sell items that are going to be healthier for communities. Mm -hmm. And the expectation is that the more affluent want and can support these things, but we know that that's not true. Yeah. That 
everyone wants yeah. and deserves right. to have the same quality Absolutely. and access to these items. That's right. We yeah. are all eaters and spend money on food, and we, everyone wants yeah. to feed their kids healthy food. So, so I'm not sure about like regulating so, the number of right, so restaurants that can operate in a, a certain community. neighborhood. Right, but I but we know that, you know, when we're talking about promotion mm -hmm. of unhealthy items, billboards and signage and radio messaging and television ads targeting these unhealthy items to mm -hmm. youth and mm -hmm. you know underserved, under resourced communities, yeah. marginalized groups that yeah. really don't need that junk. Yeah. Then that's really problematic when that's your target audience. Yep. And you know, we're looking at like soda taxes now and you know the declining sales of soda here mm -hmm. yeah. in the states yeah across but they're the, looking the country, at yeah. other regions across the world yeah. to pick up that slack yes. we look at fast food yeah. actually not being the preference for new businesses in many communities people want mm -hmm. food that's better and healthier mm -hmm. for you but we see mm -hmm. a growing market mm -hmm. in developing nations as well mm -hmm. so we're just kind of passing on these bad habits to people who aren't mm -hmm. even resourced and prepared to right. deal with them as well. So um, our last set of questions were um, really shifting to sort of how to do policy advocacy work. And you talked right. about this in your talk this morning. Um, you showed this whole pyramid of change, right? And change From the making. CDC. Yep. From it's the CDC, CDC right? Yep. So at the very bottom of the pyramid being the sort of highest impact, mm -hmm. Change is really about policy and systems level change work, right. right? Where it's not where a lot of us have always sat. So. Um, you know, at LiveWell, we're an organization that we're a statewide nonprofit, and we are trying to do more and more policy advocacy work, but we dabble in a lot of different areas, yeah. right? We do, we run some programs, we try to do policy work, we, um, we work with partners. So one thing I'm wondering about is how mm -hmm. do you, to be an effective policy advocacy organization, what does that relationship look like with actual on the ground work? Can you be yeah. an effective policy advocacy organization if you're not actually running programs and on the ground work? And how do you best inform sort of your policy agenda. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So I think I'll borrow something from folks from the hunger community mm -hmm. who look at feeding the line while ending the line. Mm -hmm. And I think as the yeah. Food Trust has approached this work in a comprehensive way, we've looked at the need to have balanced approaches. Mm -hmm. So programming around education, mm -hmm. um, around improving the food environment, mm -hmm. um, but also the policies that are needed to ensure that those programs won't be needed That's in right. the future. That's right. Right. So the yeah, bottom of that line. pyramid, yeah. right, we're talking about, yeah. I think, you know, highlighting areas mm -hmm. around poverty alleviation mm -hmm. and improved education and housing resources. I mean, those are real mm -hmm. big policy issues that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the issue around um, health and socioeconomic status mm -hmm. can't be avoided. And until we improve people's conditions in life, then we're not gonna move the needle on their health. Yeah. So fair wages are so important, it's adequate perfect. housing, yep. access to medical care, yep. like all those things, as well as increasing access to healthy food sure. and physical activity. Yep. All those things have to work in tandem yep. if we're really gonna to try to build a culture of health. Right, and I, I would assume that it means a lot of organizations working together because it's also a lot yes. to ask of one organization. I think Correct. you just said there's over a hundred employees of the food trust. Yeah, but we don't do it all. And you don't do it all, but, right. you, but you do, you do the like programming all the way to policy, but it is a lot to ask of one organization. Right. We, we do a lot and it's um, because we have great dedicated staff um, yeah. who really work hard and believe in the mission, but we partner incredibly yeah. with the Department of Health yeah. and with you know philanthropy and lots of other public health organizations and the community. Yeah. So I think that's really important we can't do this alone right. and there are going to be so many things that we're not going to be able to get to someone else has to pick that up yeah. and we'll support that and hopefully they'll support our efforts as well absolutely i think that'll continue to be some of our challenge here at live well as well is how do we continue to be a voice for policy advocacy but work with the partners that can help inform yeah. that advocacy agenda because we don't we don't know it all makes a lot of sense <laughs> Yep. So thank you so much for your time all Thanks, day Wendy. today um, and have a good safe trip home. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah.